Hello, and welcome to Monarchism Unfiltered. I'm one of your hosts, McCosk. And I'm your other host, Bronze. And on today's episode, Feudalism 2, Gastroff Strikes Back. Yeah, because last time we talked about uh, Mark Bloch. Bloch? 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 What, what, however you say it, French guy uh, defined feudalism as a set of reciprocal relationships in society. You know, I mean, you've seen the pyramid. That's He's the pyramid guy, right? But then along comes the man himself from Belgium, Francois-Louis Gonsoff, and he has new ideas about what feudalism is. He's advancing the dialectic of history because he thinks that Bloch, 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 well, however you say it, I'm going to I'm going to settle on Bloch. Bloch's idea of feudalism is too broad and he goes and 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 narrows it down. According to Gansoff, feudalism is a set of uh, it's not a set of reciprocal relationships, it's a set of legal relationships in between the nobility only that relate to them like exchanging uh soldiery for status. So it's it's essentially he's the warrior nobility guy. Blo- Blo- Bloch is the pyramid guy. Uh, Garsoff is the warrior nobility guy. Yeah. Now, there is a couple of issues with this, uh, with this take. Namely, that if uh, Bloch uh, is not that workable because it's too inclusive... Garsov is equally not as useful because it's so restrictive. Because, okay, a warrior nobility guy, gotcha, seems simple. Feudalism is when you have a warrior nobility. Is feudalism therefore a universal phenomenon? And we can just call all other societies with a warrior nobility feudal. Does that even make sense? Well, I mean, he, there's there's stipulations to it, such as. Well, they have the, there's there's got to be a very you know I mean titled nobility you know it, very 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 European much Western. Well, not exclusively though. Not exclusively Western, but like, I mean, I'm, I here's the thing. There's a, there's a, there's a forty page essay called Qu'est-ce que c'est la féodalité, which is where he talks about this, and I'm not going to read the entire essay. But essentially, it's it's you know he narrows it down to essentially you know they they gotta they gotta you know there's there's like a contractual nature. But I th- I think that you can it's either incredibly restrictive to the point that it only applies to Flanders during the high medieval period, or it it applies to a great many things. Yeah, but the issue is that that tells us nothing about how these societies actually worked. No, I mean, I think, and, I, and here I am, I'm being a little bit of a devil's advocate for Gansoff. I think, I, think he, I, I think he's saying that we shouldn't let the word feudalism do all the work in how we explain a society. So it's like, you know, just after saying the word feudalism, we can't just say, oh yeah, no, it's, it's done. Right, we've yeah. got to keep explaining. Yeah, his, his goal is to give a concrete meaning to the whole thing, which is understandable, but at the same time, like, it, 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 uh, it, it becomes too precise as to be uh, useless, because, like, come on now, okay, warrior nobility, and, uh, uh, like, it just focuses on the nobility, the, the, the elite, as it were, of medieval society and says this is what feudalism is and no other thanks uh, thanks motorcyclist for zooming on by at the speed of sound really appreciate it sorry uh, he goes on that's uh, flavor it's flavor I guess evergreen content and all that um, uh, is that like it, it becomes so narrow has to uh, truly have no use because like okay what of the roles of the peasantry what of the uh, socioeconomics and the uh, sociological dynamics of the society at large. Like, it becomes a word that describes something so narrow, like, 
Okay, what becomes the actual distinction between the term feudalism and the term warrior nobility for Glasov? Are the two just mutually exchangeable then? I think um, I think how he would uh, say is you know it's like warrior nobility. You know that's that's uh, nobility to do war, while feudalism is a specific system in which. Uh, you know, nobles exchange uh, military service for status, uh, which indirectly means land, but to him, m more specifically, it means titles. I mean, la I mean, uh, a title was uh, uh, especially yeah. the earlier you go, like essentially a deed, a deed of ownership, a certificate. Sorry, a certificate of ownership. So. Yeah, so I I don't think that he would be opposed to you know like he definitely thinks that land is part of it, but he focuses on titles. But seeing as he's a specialist on the early medieval period, it makes sense that you know land titles. You know, essentially, uh, feudalism is when the nobility exchange military service for titles. At the same time, but again, that becomes uh, uh, it becomes bigger than just. Flanders and like ignores the dynamics because then because then if we if we take that definition of place value Japan pre Han China well not all not exclusively just pre Han China but that's like the big that's the the more concentrated example um, various African states various Middle Eastern states depending on exactly the period and time frame uh, all of you of all of Western Europe all of Eastern Europe for hundreds of hundreds of years. This definition becomes so temporally broad when even taken at a fence at a face value that it becomes useless. Yeah, I mean that's certainly the argument that Susan Reynolds would make. Um, you know, but I I, I don't think that Gansoff was quite ready to let go of the term because he thought, okay, clearly there is a term. It's it's and it's a very well known term. And it clearly refers to something. Self-evidently, terms have to refer to something. D it is known. Okay, Gottlob Frager. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because even though, and I, you have a, a sort of a, a critical view of the term feudalism, as many do, if you hear someone just like out and about in uh, in the real world use the feudalism you know sort of what they mean yeah they mean the the nine inexplicably plated armor in castles and peasants that are just that are just peasants and there's no hierarchy therein maybe burgers and walled towns and stuff like that but yeah well that's if that's if you're having a very uh, cynical view of what they're talking about but yeah there's you know there is a feudalism and he thought, okay, well, clearly, feudalism relates to the aristocracy, to a and it has degree. to do with some. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he say so he, you know, I mean, so he says, okay, well, it 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 has this very broad meaning. Let's narrow it down, because right now it's doing too much work, and you know, we can't explain all of society with one term. So what if we say, okay. And he's trying, you know, he is dealing, and you know, we have to contextualize the work. Mm. He is dealing with uh, the early and high medieval low countries, which is, you know, definitely within the remit of feudalism. So he thinks, okay, clearly here there is a thing, and some of it's feudalism, but what is feudalism? And so he says that. Feudalism is this very narrowly definable legal and military process that we can observe here in Flanders, but probably also other places, even places we might not expect, such as Japan. And uh, therefore, if we say, okay, one of the processes that was going on in the high medieval period was feudalism alongside what perhaps uh, in the 21st century might call menoralism, which is something I talked about the last feudalism episode, how you know if we split those up, both terms make more sense. Although uh, I believe Gansoff 
uh, in his letters, uh, well, in the, not letters, essays that he wrote back and forth with Bloch, uh, they used the term uh, seigneury. Yeah, seigneurialism is another term that pops yeah. up. Yeah, and that was the, 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 the common term. Because what he's trying to define in Qu'est-ce que c'est la féodalité is in what way is the term feudalism distinct from sen the process of seigneury? Yeah, because and like feudalism to him is the specific part concerning the nobles and their participation in warfare in return for titles. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I understand where he's coming from. Because, okay, he just wants it nice, easy, and segmented. But I think like that just that's just not a good fit due to the extreme variety and development of, uh, of medieval society to modern society. Because, like, okay, how technical can we get about this? Because if we go by that logic, feudalism existed from the late Roman Empire... Perhaps if you, if you're being if you're feeling ballsy even earlier with Republican Rome and the and, and how you feel about the and how you feel about the functions and purpose and social status of knights in the Roman Republic, so it runs all the way from around 300 BC to 1795 if uh, uh, to 1795 if we're being overly French in our analysis. This is an intensely long period of time. And this is just for Western Europe and ignoring literally everywhere else in the planet. No, I, I, I understand that it's uh, broad. But maybe you, you could view that as that makes it more useful because we can use it in many contexts. Sure, but it tells us nothing about these contexts. It becomes just a useless object. Ad, uh, adjective then, because okay, what, what like d does the aristocracy exist in a bloody vacuum? It doesn't. It it interacts with all other elements of society. Obviously, not with the same level of intensity and all this yada yada yada. But you, in order to comprehend blank, you need to understand the context of blank to begin with, which this analysis kind of falters. Because it just it, it it rather than it rather than providing a tool to analyze the context, it just presupposes a bunch of shit and comes up with a term that fits neatly with those presuppositions rather than anything substantive. Okay, so what are the what are the key pr fatal presuppositions that Gansoff makes? Simple. He is assuming that uh, that the relationship between. Uh, uh, land and military service is necessarily military service because he, he's the warrior nobility guy. But like, what about scootage, which is not, which is, sure it's it's a development of later medieval, but it was a thing throughout. People could commute their military service to pay essentially. What what then of feudalism? This is a fairly common occurrence, especially in Western feudalism. I don't think it's a stretch to say that that's still, uh, you know, within the wider system. You know, like, like he's still engaged in the process of title for military service. He's just like he's on a payment plan, doesn't you know? Sure, but at the same. Only time, if I you're an absolutist in applying the term does that become an issue. I suppose. I suppose in that sense you do have a point. But the another main issue is the following: When does it begin and when does it end? Because. Again, by that logic, there would still be feudal countries in the developed West today, because some countries do actually still like give land to veterans and shit like that. Uh, I can't remember quite uh, well. De de developed West. But do happening. they give? Do they give aristocratic titles? As a matter of course. No, but then again, neither did feudalism. Because okay, perhaps. Because, because, of course, because, is a because, bit of a harsh term. Because, like, I, it just hit me. Um, Yeomen, they received land, uh, rented land, for military service, and yet received no title. Though they did receive the rank of uh, half villain and consequently of Yeoman, and therefore had a series of rights. But, definitionally... Yeah, but are they nobles? They are not. That means that, according to Gansoff, that they're, they're not part of the question. 
but they're, but they're, but, 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 this, but, that, but that alone is a strike against Garsov, because yeomanry, military recruitment, part of the military service of the aristocracy and the means and mechanisms by which they did their military service is critically important to understand the, the relations of feudalism and between the aristocrats and the king. To cut that out from the outset is absurd. It's, it's okay, that is a little bit strange. But um, so I'm, I'm looking through Garsov's work. Also, to while, while Bronze looks to contextualize, Garsov has a major disadvantage, is that he never wrote one big book on feudalism. He wrote a shit ton of essays about it, uh, separate. So kind of looking up what he, he, what he would have thought about topic X, Y, Z, or W is not exactly a clear and clean process. Okay, so uh, in the actual book, he's not he's not keying in fully on warrior nobility. That's that's often how he's portrayed as the warrior nobility guy. But but apparently he's more broad. So I, I you know like essentially it's the systems of service and conduct that the nobles engage in. So it's and then he goes on to define a bunch of stuff. So. Military service, yes, but scootage also, or other kinds of service in terms and other kinds of rewards are all also all part of it. Okay. Yeah. But that, uh, but that, uh, but, uh, also that is that is assuming another another of the ma of the major propositions I want to point out is that he's assuming that all societies that have those elements military service for the sake of titles, land, prestige, social status, what have you, all necessarily work and have similar dynamics. Which, again, is not necessarily the case. I'm not sure he's assuming that as much as he's assuming they share a common feature. But then, but then we have... It's, it's, it's just that, like... It's still too bloody narrow. Like I understand where he comes from. I can get the point and the and the kind of project behind the whole terminology, but it's just it's too bloody narrow because that just becomes a pointless descriptor. It's not it's not something you can objectivize because then what would be the topic of study of feudalism? But an endless uh, but an endless uh, enumeration of. Um, of uh, 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 of courtly titles, uh, court ritual, and stuff like that. I think that uh, he is being far more prescriptive than than you're assuming, because you're sort of thinking of him writing in a way that perhaps a modern historian would—that he's trying to describe something. Yeah, more or less. But he's, yeah, but 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 you see. That's not how... In the 1930s, they had a lot more room to be prescriptive. He's not saying, oh, this is what I think it is. He's saying, from now on, this is what the term means. And so, I have concluded the discussion of feudalism. And so, if we want to discuss other stuff, that will, you know, we will go on discussing the Middle Ages. But as for what feudalism is, I have defined it here. Boom. That is aggressively French. It's so aggressively French. But if, if you look at like his history pre-1950, this is a lot more common. Fair, fair, uh, fair enough, but I'm just... Because, you know, if, if you think that like now, you know, we're all on the internet and the majorly published journals and so the, the entire field of medievalists is out there communicating with each other. Gansoff is writing an article that is mostly going to be read by francophone medievalists. And so he only needs to be internally consistent with other francophone medievalists, mostly in Belgium. Right, and so as long as the people he's talking to understand what he means, that to him is fine. I can... I, I, I can... I... Okay, that makes that makes sense contextually, contingently. I would even add the, uh, but okay, he has a certain internal consistency, 
But then, but like, that's just so limiting, though. Because, like... It because, is limiting. Because it, 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 I, no, I would, even, I would even go a step further than limiting. It's stifling. Because, like... Uh, got that. I mean, in hindsight, I'm thinking, would he even want to listen to non-Francophone voices on the matter? Because didn't he supposedly, like, quit his tenure because his university decided to teach classes in... Uh, Walloon. In Flemish. Oh, in Flemish. The Walloons speak French. God damn it. So so it shows how much I care. Um, I I think you would I think you would have been interested. Um, but yeah, if you think about like what's around at the the time, essentially you have blocky. I mean, much many more people today. Are adherents of 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 block than they are of Gansoff. Just because you can do a whole lot more with 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 block, which is why probably when you grew up in school, this this is not not only aimed at Mikas but also the listener. You know, in in your history textbook, you probably did have the pyramid. The pyramid was everywhere, especially when we were studying uh, both medieval history, but also. Um, the uh, the history of the Industrial Revolution and the part where we touched upon the Marxists and the pyramid popped up again. There's many pyramids, yeah. Pyramids are a common motif throughout human society. Who knew? Um, yeah, but I I think that I think that we have to give Gansoff some credit. I mean, yeah, because like in that he was uh, one of the earliest proponents of thinking critically about the term. Yeah, but no, and um, he was trying to move somewhere. Yeah, no, as I do opposed, not, which I, wasn't. I do not deny it, but like I think, but like because, for example, like I was saying, like his analysis has a kind of a faulty uh, logic to it the further along uh, time you go, etc. But this is not necessarily the case the backwards you go. If you go to real early, Mer say, Merovingian, Carolingian era, the focus on the aristocracy, in part because we have such scant records of everything else, actually becomes very relevant. And in that, even if you're just focusing on the, on the aristocracy and little else, because, well, you have little else to work with, it uh, you can get some interesting information and like figure out some patterns that would later be relevant. Well, they, they were relevant back then, but would later have far greater impact in medieval society as time went on. So I think that contingently and in some aspects he can be useful, but again, it's very narrow. Yeah, it is. It is narrow, but also I think if you you know, if you say start at the year twelve hundred. And you keep and you go backwards from there. I think it's I think it's a reasonably workable definition. Yeah, but so if we add to, to the to to his definition, warrior nobility, blah blah blah, Western Europe, eight hundred to twelve hundred. Hmm. I think it works. I would go a bit. I would go a bit, a bit, a bit before the eight hundreds, like. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, it's not an exact date mark, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but uh, but I would I would I would put it at Merovingian, six hundreds to twelve hundreds. Yeah, and that's certainly an interesting period of history. Post Roman you know. Europe in general was when Europe was at its most interesting. Yeah, and I mean, you you will see that the the main critics of Gansoff, uh, here I'm thinking of uh, Elizabeth Brown and Reynolds. It appears. Well, I mean, Brown studied also the Capetians, which overlaps with Gansoff, but they they are much more interested in the late medieval period, mm -hmm. and so trying to understand the fourteen hundreds in like Gansoffian terms does become very hell. ridiculous. It becomes a, a fresh hell because, like, you then have sub infuled sub infuidation, uh, sub infiefment, depending upon exactly how you pronounce that hell that hellish term, 
which just kind of br- where, where his analysis just completely falls flat. Like it can't even explain what its warrior nobility is is even is doing anymore due to sub infeudation, a, f- a very important process in both France and uh, England in the lead up to the Hundred Years' War, and during obviously, and some and obviously after it as well. But that's a different topic. Yeah. Also, it's important to mention that. Uh... Uh, like the 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 question of of feudalism was was just one very small part of of Gansoff's work, and he is you know considered uh, almost to today the preeminent scholar of Flanders during the early and, and high medieval periods. An important, uh, uh... And, or and perhaps even the Car- Carolingians at large. Yeah, because like. I mean, because right. So in actually, his actually, actually let's uh, um, let's let, let's focus a bit on on the Low Countries during these time periods because it's an interesting area. Because the Low Countries were, as I hope, as I hope, our dear listeners, who I'm now imagining have a working understanding of medieval history and its and and some particulars of Flanders, uh, know uh, that this area was uh, near. It was in the Lowlands. And it's a swampy hell wall because all all of it was a swampy hell wall. But it was actually intensely wealthy due to industrial, uh, not industrial, cottage industry, uh, specifically. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's not tissues. It's uh, fibers. No, it's clothiers, Cloths. weavers, uh, stuff related with the manufacture of cloth. Uh, and uh, the and it's an interesting area. Because it's it, it's also like an area that eventually would doom his analysis because it would be one of the earliest eras where burghers would rise to preeminence in uh, in society and as well in, as well in, as in uh, aristocratic courts. The other real uh, the other other real uh, region that's in which this starts early is Italy with its uh, communal revolution. So like I I do find like I um I do not doubt his ability, uh, especially on focus on the Carolingians because of the Carolingians it, it it is really more both cost effective and beneficial for clarity really if you just focus on the dynamics between the aristocracies because it it it, it just makes uh, it just makes it easier to make sense of what is going on but I do find it weird that like I mean. I mean, then again, we, do, we like like this is Flanders v Holland, which were two although similarly related areas under different logics. I would actually, I would actually like to th- uh, wonder what would, what would he, what would be his take on the Frisian freedom and similar dynamics up in the lowlands uh, in the Low Countries. That would be very interesting. Sadly, he's dead. It's been dead for uh, for some for some time, but uh, I just wanted to bring up his extensive scholarship because he was saying, oh, well, his definition of feudalism doesn't really explain much about society. But I think for him, a natural response would be, no, you have to. You, that's why you have to read my 119 other essays about the period, which, from looking at his bibliography, cover everything from city planning to agriculture to the wars and uh, dynastic politics. Yes, I would like to point out that none of us are calling, well, mostly me, because I'm clearly representing the anti-Gostoffian faction here. None of us are saying... Yeah, I have somehow been com- pigeonholed into being... Pr- I've somehow been yeah. pigeonholed into b- being the pro Gansoff guy. Yeah, because... Uh, well, uh, then the breaks, I guess. Uh, none of us are saying that he was somehow uh, not competent and not a worthy scholar to read. It's just that his definition of feudalism n- not workable because it just deprives of a term to call it all. And 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 like you can and as you might have guessed during this entire conversation, where he where okay, but what about the rest of the social dynamics in which this in which this thing is clearly integrated with? And as far as Bronze and I can ascertain, though we may be wrong, his answer would be something along the lines of read my other body of work. Becomes kind of a non-answer to an issue. Like, 
This is why we create terms. This is why some terms invoke images that simplify meaning. And so, like, he, 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 he looked up the feudalism, says, this covers too much. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's narrow it down, give it focus, etc. He narrowed it down to a point that he, actually private, uh, that he actually deprived us of a term to describe the wider societal dynamics. It's, uh, I... it's very difficult, this thing, history. Mm -hmm. Very complicated thing. It's just, yeah. And, and uh, uh, another thing I would like to point out is that, I, like, because because I, I suppose I suppose, uh, like I, I, in the first episode, bronze, you were like, okay, feudalism is the social dynamic, manuralism is the economic dynamic, essentially. If memory serves, that was your take, right? That was sort of my take, yeah. So, would you consider Garsoff's focus uh, on, on on aristocratic dynamics to to essentially be a component of your definition? I would definitely say Garsoff has been influential for me, yeah. Okay, because because now I'm wondering. Is this, is, is, is this like a view problem kind of deal? Because like, for example, I myself, as do others who see, who, who study, I mean, as do others who study, as, as if I was somehow a medievalist. Uh, but let, let, let me rephrase. Dis disclaimer, neither of us are medievalists. And if we're talking, talking completely out of our asses, uh, comment, email, you know, because we are more than interested. Yeah. If, you know, actual medievalists have critiques. Oh, also, I mean, also a, a slight addendum to that. Yet, because uh, Bronze here is going to go study <laughs> medievalism. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. He's yeah, going to so, go but I'm not a medievalist yet. Yeah, he's gonna go study Hungary, a medieval uh, medi uh, Hungary during the medieval ages. Well, late Renaissance. Actually, now that we're this, this is an excellent segue, because I wanted to talk about how how how, how basically this is. I see medi like medieval slash feudalism slash as as one big thing, like I, I, I tr as a big concrete thing, or as a big. Uh, separate thing, and like you, and by extension, Gasoff, see it as a composite thing, and how this, um, and how this, like, kind of impacts the imaginary of like the feudal, uh, of like the, of like, because how it impacts the imaginary itself evidently impacts how we think about it, and like the fact that you're going to go study Hungary is, is kind of curiously. I just, I just want to, I just want to. Another disclaimer: I'm not gonna start like defining like when was uh, is uh, like my it's uh, the the proposal for my research is much more specialist. It essentially has to do with trade. Yes, but the focus of medieval Hungary is interesting in of itself because the Hungary, along with the Grand Duchy of um, Grand Duchies, so, oh, I wished it had reached such heights. The Duchy of Burgundy under Charles the Great, uh, Charles the Great, Charles the Bald. Wow, my 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 pro my pro, uh, pro Burgundy, my pro Burgundian stance really coming strong today, huh? Grand the Grand Duchy led by Charles the Great, Slayer of the Swiss. Um, So uh, these two states, the Duchy of Burgundy and the Kingdom of Hungary, both in the late medieval ages, are kind of what inform our imaginary of the medieval ages. Even though most of the most the relevant periods of both were actually post-medieval, uh, you see this in uh, many ways. The depending exactly on the type of fantasy slash historical fiction going at play here, there is some variation between which is which. But the but the backbone of all um, f fantasy interpretations of medieval states, of human medieval states, sometimes people get creative with elves and the like, is very much so 
ordinance Burgundy, in which you have a king. The state is still clearly feudal. There is still clearly uh, manors, lords, uh, and uh, vassalage to give troops and etc. But an emergence of a professionalized uh, armed forces, uniforms in a clear, distinctive pseudo-national style. This, of course, was the armorials of the Dukes of Burgundy. Uh, the, uh, like, uh, the focus is on knighthood and nobility, which was very much a Burgundian thing. Uh, while uh, while uh, Hungary typically provides the context in which this is set, a mountain ki a kingdom with a big nat natural border, the Carpathians, against uh, literally the hordes, be it historically the Mongols, or, uh, or in fantasy as it often is, the evil empire, the, uh, the orcs, what have you. And these two, and, and, and I would like to point out how, how confusing the topic of feudalism is, and this kind of goes back to the early, to what I said, about how, how when people talk about feudalism, they imagine knights inexplicably in plate armor, is that the ideal of what people think of most of feudalism is more often than not the early Renaissance to late and little else. Yeah, also, I would, I would like to, to also add that uh, to, uh, Hungary also gives us our fantasy king, which are all, almost always a, a discount Matthias Corvinus. That is true. Yeah, which uh, is very understandable, because um, oh god, I've I've read I've read books about this. Um, obviously, fantasy in its origins draws heavily from folk from folk from yeah, and and uh, Matthias Corvinus became something of a folklore wise king figure in both. In many countries, include Hungary, but also I, I think um, the whole Slovenia, world. and I think also Croatia, with other main ones. Yeah, but also like it had it had an impact in the Holy Roman Empire, if memory serves, because yeah, the, it it spread on a lot. Yeah. Sadly, Charles the Bold is is remembered for his rashness rather than his other achievements. But one day, one day, one day Burgundy shall rise again and we shall drive the Swiss back into their caves. Um, man, I just burned, uh, I just burned any chance in hell we had of ever getting, of ever getting sponsored by Swiss Bank, didn't I? That's, uh, that's fine. I mean, I think, I, th I think it was sooner or later going to happen. Sure. True. But yeah, the 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 like, like the complexity of terms is because like we are now operating on a different imaginary than they uh, than uh, Garsoff and Block themselves were operating. Because I mean, if well, well, if, if we are to be very simplistic and simplify this, like it's two thirds. It's no, it's not two thirds. One third Lord of the Rings, two thirds Dungeons and Dragons, largely. Which is majority uh, Burgundy and uh, Hungary. So like, it, it, and how like, and, and like, and how this makes it increasingly complicated to actually define feudalism, because now we're because not only now does the word have to match up to the definitions to like the, the historical reality, but also other people's expectations. Because I can, I, I can tell you, there are people out there who think plate armor is a de facto requirement of feudalism. And not on something so simplistic and superficial, oh, because of his text, but because of like the belief that plate armor truly allowed for the supremacy of the armed warrior that until that point did not exist. Which is not... Yeah, or... Uh, it's not unreasonable. Really not 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 even so much plate armor, but a very common one is stirrups. Mm -hmm. Stirrup. stirrup theory is very common to the point that in the vid yeah, this is how hip I am. In the video game civilizations, uh, m multiple of them, it is the prerequisite technology to unlock feudalism is the stirrup. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I, I might add the stirrup being only relevant to warrior nobility means that Gasov 
uh, uh, so basically what you're saying is Siv is Garshloff pilled? Um, I, I don't know how how, how Garshloff felt about stirrup theory. Although I, I well know that stirrup theory really came and went. It did, didn't it? Like it, it, it used yeah, to be... Yeah, because uh, we did a bunch of archaeology uh, on discovering the early stirrups. And also, like, we discovered that people can actually do couched, couch launch charges without a stirrup. Yeah. In fact, uh, when stirrups first came around, they were m mainly for old people who, who, who couldn't get on their horses properly. Yeah. We also have to remember that most of the ridiculously tall and big breeds of horses are a fairly recent phenomenon, and that in medieval ages, they were not that big. They were still massive compared to the people, don't get me wrong, but they weren't that... Like, like the, the, ample, the gap wasn't so extreme. Largely because, like, we know the recorded heights of many a king, not the heights of their horses. So... If you if you go if you compare the 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 size of a Mondesterier with your uh, stereotypical um, medieval king, that the, the the strong out meter sixty uh, with a modern Desterrier, it 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 would be pretty much impossible for the poor man to climb up the horse. So there's also like that, but because if if memory serves, that was also like an issue with stirrup theory. They just assume that the that there was a, uh, that the breeds were, had remained essentially unchanged, which is not an unreasonable assumption, all things considered. But feed impacts size and feed quality of both humans and horses has increased over the centuries. That, yeah, yeah, I mean, for for uh, I mean, the thing you have to remember is that you know they didn't they didn't even like have horse breeds in the mi mi Middle Ages. They had, as we know them today, they had ho they, they did have horse types. Hmm. So they're like, oh, that's... But they didn't have like, oh, yeah, no, that's that family of horses because th they hadn't gotten that far into the, m the modern type of selective breeding where you have different horse breeds. That's an early modern phenomenon. Yeah, true, true. It's that... But yeah, that, but this, but again, another thing that I would, but this just further illustrates how contemporary suppositions color our understanding of the past and allows us to create theories that, seemingly solid on paper, stirrup theory, turn out to be not very solid at all. I mean, another thing that I would like to cre uh, to criticize. This is not necessarily Garstoff in particular, but a lot of people seem to have this take, largely people who play CK2. And three, I guess, because that's since launched, is that they have this very, very um, rigid, yeah, rigid is the word, rigid interpretation of like how feudal hier hierarchy worked. It, 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 like it was, I mean, God, it's it, it's also an incredibly complicated term, but suffice to say for this episode at the absolute minimum that. It was, while not always constantly in the state of flux, it was something that varied, and there was genuine flexibility, etc., etc., etc. Like these are interpersonal reactions that shaped states and their dynamics. And as anyone, and as anyone who interacts with other peoples can tell and vouch, it's a complicated thing which shit tons of nuance, which is not exactly which uh, nuance one shouldn't ignore. Yeah, I mean, you know, people people are complex, and there's there's you know many layers to it. Yeah. But so like, okay, I I know the episode's about Garsoff, but like, okay, so so I think we can all kind of agree that Garsoff's definition is so limited to not really have much use outside of either such an incredibly limited space to time frame in Europe, or on the most vaguest and not really useful. Uh, understandings of the term AI. Yeah, what does it? What does feudalism? Does uh, Japanese, Indian, and Chinese feudalism exist? Uh, were they a thing? Were they not? And this definition, yada yada yada. So, so like, w so like, what is what is the current state of the art? Is it just blo uh, new blockianism, or or do we have a whole cohort of medievalists who just look up 
just look upon the sky and say, feudalism wasn't real. I mean, th there are definitely, uh, you know, so-called uh, critical peop uh, scholars of, of feudalism. I, there's, there's also, you know, neo-blockians that like hold that feudal feudalism is a valuable concept and it describes medieval society in a very broad way. But I, but I think those people are still very much influenced by Gansov in the way that they think of what that means. Oh no, I'm not. Say, so I'm, not I'm not saying. Uh, so it's not more. Yeah, I, th I think. I think the current fashion is either a critical definition, which has its own flaws, but we'll get to that at some other time. And uh, like a, a Gansov inspired neo-Blokianism. I mean, I mean, uh, clearly, like uh, Garsov complements Bloch, basically, and in, in, in like because. But, but because like block just just also includes the 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 social dynamics between the aristocracy and the king, and block just focus on that. So so they naturally complement each other. They just have slightly different focuses. In this narrow context, again, like Garsoff did not make his life about defining feudalism. He he did other work, but again, the fact that. There, he 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 wrote down new big book about his uh, like there is no single place where you can like read up all of this. So like the way we have access to the information comes very fragmented in Garsov. So it's kind of hard to tell if we are being fair and in, in 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 making this oh it was too narrow too too useless or if we are being unfair uh, and maybe if we read the entire 160 works. We would come to oh, it's actually, this very technical term that he uses in a multitude of different contexts, in which it becomes very useful. But that is still kind of fairly unworkable, things considered. Also, uh, uh, I'd say the majority of, of Gansov's work has not been translated into English. That's a big block. Oh God. Exactly. I, I can't uh, believe I yeah. made that with a straight face. Um, I love it. Gotta love it. Uh, yeah, it, it certainly said its mark upon the conversation. Oh my God. You know, we sometimes hold up to, to delusions that we have standards of quality, of entertainment, or just standards in general. This episode proved that we have none. There's no standards. There is there, there is only there is only uh, desperate attempts at describing incredibly complicated topics, way above our prey grade, and the worst puns ever made. That's right. I mean, we can all all remember the interuniversal Teichmüller theory episode. Well, I mean, I mean, I remember it. Me too, because I was there. Yeah, I was there too. Yeah, no, it was it was it was very complex. Yeah. But you know, that's that's our shtick is is explaining complex things badly, so that we it's can cultivate, mark, yeah, so that we can cultivate in you, the listener, the curiosity to actually look up this shit. Yeah. Because because God knows we can't be arsed. No, we do actually look up this shit. We just don't actually do the do intense reviewing sessions pre episode. So we are only pulling thirty percent of all we say out of our ass. Yeah. Ish. Ish. But again, not not again. It's just that like slightly back onto the topic of like the imaginary and stuff. It is kind of a missed opportunity, don't you think? Like because you have these other like literally insert other few, uh, other vaguely medieval state in here. And you have a fairly unique environment that has never really been well depicted in fantasy. I mean, not even just fantasy, fiction in general. When's the last time you heard about Portuguese feudalism, Bronze? I'll be honest that I don't know. All I know is, um, uh, you know, Hungarian warrior king settles somewhere in there. And then oh, they yeah. fight the Saracens... And then, 
and then they go across the seas. Is that's that's my understanding of the Middle Ages as Portugal. It, you could only make that interpretation more enriching if you mentioned, oh, and he married an enchanted Moor, uh, because that that's to give some context. Bronze is referring to the belief that was common in the 16th century. So common, in fact, it's in the Lusiads, in which the father of our first king, Don Enrique, was actually a Hungarian. Somehow, some way. Note, this was not actually the case. He was, predictably, as all that is good and righteous of the medieval ages, he came from Burgundy. In fact, he was a member of the Elder House of Burgundy, which makes, a, which makes the Portuguese House of Burgundy a cadet branch of the Capets. Very prestigious. Very prestigious. That Capet cred, though. But yeah, no, but it's like, but it's like, it, it's like a missed, it's like a missed uh, opportunity, really, because like, I mean, it's not just you and me. Anyone can, any any person with uh, that reads even the slightest things can point out. Fantasy genre is kind of stagnant, isn't it? And like, I wonder how much of this is just because like, uh, uh, like the, like most people aren't even aware that they're taking most of their cues from uh, again la uh, early. McCask uh, just set the comment section on fire. Like, you know, like we're gonna have Brandon Sanderson. Like, like, you cannot tell me that contemporary Western fantasy is not stagnant to shit. Okay, I, I will admit that it, it, that it can be somewhat stagnant, yeah. Although they, they've, um, no, I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah, like, 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 the point here is, I wonder how much of this is that they cannot overcome themselves because they, most fantasy writers... Though uh, the, uh, the, I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that fantasy writers don't do research, but they rare, but they often rely on tropes, and because they don't realize that these tropes harken back to the blessed state of Burgundy and uh, early Renaissance Hungary. It's just I should probably just change my handle to Makosk Burgundy Propagandist. You know what? Fuck it. I'm owning up to that. This podcast is officially pro Burgundy. Um, there, there you go. If we get, if we, uh, you, this, if we ever get uh, sponsored by the Burgundy Board of Tourism, bronze. I mean, technically, does no longer exist because Burgundy was merged with three other departments. Well, not departments, whatever the fuck. Um, but back to, but back to the fantasy. How, how? Because okay, bronze. Russian medieval fantasy. I, I can see it, yeah. I mean, there was there was the like the ballet russe in uh, 1910 that did stuff like that, you know, with the firebird and rite of spring and stuff, you know. Yeah, you have you you have uh, Russian folklore and all that, but like actually like depicting the reality of being in a in, in a glorified wood fort of a town in, uh, in near a great river in the frigid east. As like an actual setting, the, the 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 how how you would have the how you would have in some areas the overwhelmingly powerful uh, aristocracy verging on absolutism, which is not exactly historically accurate, but relevant, but uh, good for but good for a plot setting. Vis-a-vis -vis these cities with overwhelmingly powerful merchants, the societal the uh, the societal subtext set one another with battles upon rivers and Viking raids and you know, interesting stuff rather than stereotypical, rather than stereotypical Western over Western feudal states, like even maritime military states, uh, military medieval states in fantasy typically take from the Italian city states, and not that well, mind you. It comes from uh, it comes from a, a, a hyper saccharine understanding of the Italian city states, like, like where in. Uh, Oh come on, Bronze. When's the last time in a fantasy setting where you where where, where you saw corruption depicted? Uh, look, I mean, I understand that, but also I think perhaps Mikosk 
I feel like I I have seen uh, corruption in fantasy. I feel like I feel like you you know there there is a difference between uh, a fantasy and historical realism, the genre, right? And and historical fiction. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand that because I'm I, I'm talking about I'm talking about like how to uh, has a. Uh, as a re I understand what you mean. Yeah, it's. A, I'm not that saying. Like, I'm not saying. I'm not saying they. Oh, it, they should inject all, all, uh, all, all, all realism in it to fix fantasy because that just make it stop being fantasy. I'm talking about. I'm talking about like as a part of a process to overcome the current stagnation, a refocusing of inspiration and basing themselves in something other than Burgundy and Hungary. Would perhaps help. Also, I think that not everyone would agree with your stagnation assessment. I would not agree with those people. Because no, like, I understand that, right? But but I am going to make a bold claim here, hmm. which is that most people who are seeking to publish a, a fantasy novel belong to the to the to the camp that the the state of fantasy fi fantastic fiction right now is not decrepit and stagnant in fact i've often heard it said that we are in the midst of a fantasy boom how number of works published we live contemporaneously with brandon sanderson that's Right, I think uh, I think you want Tolkien, but the market bears Brandon Sanderson. I mean, I don't even necessarily want Tolkien. I just I'm not saying you want specifically Tolkien, uh, but I think you understand my remark. I I, I understand your I understand what you mean the the, the 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 groundedness. I mean, but but then again, like Tolkien, Tolkien does stand as evidence because Gondor was of all things actually inspired in bloody Venice for once. Gondor is probably the most sterling depiction of Venice I have ever seen in fiction. Specifically, uh, note when I say this is, is book Gondor, especially the architecture as described in the book is inspired by Venetian architecture. The movies go, that, uh, go, uh, go in another direction. But yeah, Gondor is in yeah, part man. inspired by Venice. I mean, we don't talk about movies on this this podcast that would be yeah obviously the book um yeah i i think that though i might share your misgivings about about the current state of fantasy i don't know how realistic it is to have them addressed i mean true in a in a way if i if i uh, uh, like trampling a creator unless 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 you're about to write uh, a semi-realist fantasy masterpiece set in a in a model of uh, 14th century Lithuania, that would actually be interesting. Early Renaissance Lithuania, the str the emergent struggles of of, of Catholicism vis-a-vis -vis the last remnants of paganism. You see, it works on many levels, but obviously at that point it's more hist right because you know, at some point you also have to add in the fantasy elements, right? Yeah, but th but that's but that's yeah. not overly complicated. Christian ma Christian uh, mythology on 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 one hand, vis a vis ancient pagan mythology on the background. Another inter another interesting aspect is that such a context would be an excellent discussion on uh, on the nature of good and evil when with the with the seminal transition of uh, Lithuania from a small periphery a peripheral state to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania one of the largest states in Eastern Europe at its time especially with its conquest of uh, parts of Ukraine and Belarus like the, the the entire discussion between the transition from kingdom, which in fantasy are typically good, to an empire in air quotes, which are typically evil, is in of itself a good uh, uh, a good uh, a good scenario because, like, again, the politics of fantasy are also stagnant. 
Right, but I, I think I think at some point you have to start. You know, you have to almost imagine it. Uh, fantasy is something beyond historical allegory. Perhaps, but it still operates under the same tropes. Well, not uh, not that history operates under the same tropes. It still operates under tropes generated from history. So at a certain level. Uh, so at a certain sure. level, it's uh, just that I, I I feel like, with with all due respect, Mikosk, the the critique has gone gone somewhat less pointed. That is over, okay. Over fa 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 fair enough. Fair enough. Just to 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 refocus, I just think that a good way to overcome the at least in my view, apparent stagnation of the of the of Western fantasy would be to recenter its basis on somewhere other than Burgundy or Hungary. Maybe that could potentially have a positive effect. But I the thing is, I don't think most contemporary fantasy writers are, are out there thinking, oh yeah, no, my story is based on 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 um, Burgundy or Hungary. That's the issue. They aren't. That's my point. They aren't aware of that. They just assume mm. that their tropes are neutral and inherent to the, to the genre when it's not necessarily the case. Like I'm talking, I'm talking in terms of inspirations, basically, because a lot of them operate under the stereotypical assumptions that we get from Hungary and Burgundy, with perhaps a bit of England and France mixed into the mix, in, uh, mixed into the mix, added to the mix, to give some colorful terminology here and there, or to or to give uh, social dynamics, especially on England. Um, that that I think that having a different basis and foundation, other than these pre-assumed ones. Like what I'm saying is, they have a confirmation bias, and maybe not going uh, going against that confirmation, uh, that Hungary, Burgundy, uh, France, and England uh, confirmation bias about that informs fantasy, and going el elsewhere, not just necessarily in the rest of the world, just elsewhere in Europe, for example, is a good uh, would be a, would be a positive shift. I understand. Um... But I feel like, and and I think we almost have to start leaving it here because th th we're going very far off track. But I feel like the problems that you're pointing to are not so much related to um, historical source material, though that could be part of it, as they are to theories of literature in general. Fair enough. I can see the point. And I mean, uh, not okay. You know what? I'm not. Because you've already lit the, the 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 comment section on fire, so I'm gonna I'm gonna light it like I'm gonna start pouring the petrol. Uh, if fantasy writers, I think that you're experiencing that sense of stagnation not because they are bad, they are examples of bad historical a allegory, but because they're bad novels. Damn. Damn. And on that bombshell. <laughs> Uh, I've been McCosk. And I've been Bronze. And this has been Monarchism Unfiltered. Good night. Good night.